It's uh, Stuart Lancaster here and welcome to my leadership club. I really hope um, you get something out of this. There's, there's all sorts of modules, lots of presentations, lots of thoughts and reflections for you as uh, leaders and um, uh, I'm looking forward to passing on what I've learned. It's certainly not um, everything that, that I've done, um, but it's from coaches and leaders that I've worked with or for or observed. Uh, it's a combination, really, and um, uh, I really hope you do you do get something out of it. Um, I think the plan really is for you to to work them through, uh, work through the modules in your own time and the presentations, um, make any reflection notes, and then obviously um, we'll have webinars and opportunities to to take questions and expand on some of the things that really resonate with you. But before you start, I want you to um, start on this presentation for a reason because. We can't build a team without a foundation, and this presentation really is how you build the foundation uh, in any team that you're working in. So these are my top three tips, so um, I hope you get a lot of them. They're only, uh, it's only going to be about a 10 minute presentation, there's only about three or four slides, but there's a lot of things for you to think about and hopefully reflect on uh, as you consider your own leadership um, roles. So number one, Fairly obviously to have a plan. I think um, a lot of great coaches and leaders I've worked with um, have had great ideas but no long-term plan. I think what I'm trying to say here is we need a plan um, that could be something beyond winning. Now, obviously in a sporting context, the, the plan is to win the next trophy and to win the trophy at the end of the season. Um, but I had a very interesting talk um, as a national coach when we brought in uh, Andrew Strauss to talk about how England cricket at the time were very successful. And he said their plan was to, um, uh, to win the Ashes and to become the number one ranked team in the world. He also then went on to say, he said, the problem was once we'd done that, um, we, we downed tools, we enjoyed the moment. And whilst they were enjoying the moment, all the opposition were improving their game and learning from what England's success. And uh, very quickly, England went from number one to number five. Um, and I think the message is quite quite simple, really. Um, obviously, it's important for the next quarter and the next year um, and the next trophy to, to plan to win it, um, but also something beyond that um, and something um, uh, a higher purpose, really, that engages uh, the hearts and minds of the people that you're leading. Uh, because the question is, what happens when you achieve your goals? And I think, like I say, to have a higher purpose, something that you're striving to achieve and beyond winning is is massively motivational for people that you're leading, and uh, and keep reinforcing it and keep talking about it as well as the obviously the short and medium term goals of of winning the next trophy. I think the second point in terms of um, the fundamentals of building teams is have a point of view about building how you build your team. Um, and um, what I mean by this is if you're the leader, you're the person who's going to inspire and motivate the people that follow you. So therefore, do it your way. Um, now, there's lots of different ways to, to build teams and there's no right or wrong way. But what people want from their leader is um, clarity of vision, they want a point of view, and they want someone to follow. And if you're not, if you're not prepared to give that, then you're effectively, you know, you're better off going into a managerial role where you, you operate the day-to-day -day and the week-to-week -week functionality of, um, of organizations rather than actually leading organizations. So I have a point of view, and I think for me, um, uh, my point of view um, is, is this really. You don't get high performance and tag culture on the end. Uh, in order to get a long-term high performing team, you must get your culture right. And uh, that means getting the right people on the bus, it's getting um, uh, the right values, the right behaviours instilled in them, uh, and doing things for the right reason. And uh, I've seen teams do it the other way around, where they just focus on high performance, and they get short-term success, but long-term Ultimately, if you don't get the behaviours right and the values and the people that you're leading, then ultimately um, it, uh, uh, it usually falls apart at some point, irrespective of how many wins you've had. So people often say, what does culture look like? Um, uh, and I heard some great quotes the other day, uh, which described it, I think, really well. Uh, it wasn't on the back of the All Blacks, but it does remind me of the All Blacks, the rugby team who are unbelievably successful, won in two World Cups. Um, now they, in 2004, uh, recognised they had cultural issues and went to build uh, a new team with a new culture. They didn't quite achieve their goal in 2007, 
Um, but in 2011, 2015, they've gone and won the World Cup. And um, they've got a very, very strong culture um, that uh, is beyond just winning cups. It's about inspiring their nation and pulling people together and giving them that higher purpose that we've talked about. But equally, also, if I reckon we were to look at the culture of the All Blacks, they attract the best in the industry. Um, so great coaches want to coach there, great practitioners want to work in the team, and great players want to stay in the team. Now, there's obviously all, uh, other opportunities for players to leave New Zealand and, and make money elsewhere, but because the culture is so strong, they want to stay and they want to play, and that would be a great message to give your organisation. And the final point is this. When they look back at their time in the organisation of the All Blacks or your team or whoever's team we're talking about, they say that was the best time of my career. And I think if you can say that um, and you can achieve that in people's minds, then you've clearly got a fantastic culture. Within that, I, I would also focus on the reason why working for your organisation is important. So I'm sure you've seen this before, um, but if you haven't, basically, a lot of people who go and build teams start from the outside and work in. So they talk about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, but they never talk to their employees or the people they're leading the reason why we're all going to work hard for this team or this organisation. And my recommendation would be to do it the other way around. So start with the reason why, um, paint a clear picture about the um, opportunities that the um, team that you're working in can afford them, that the, the vision of what you want to achieve as a group, um, and, and really work on that, that motivation, that intrinsic motivation of the reason why. And then say, this is how we're going to do it, and this is what we're going to do. And it's a simple analogy, but it's often... Um, we get it wrong, and certainly in my time um, back to when I was a teacher uh, many years ago, um, I often felt we missed that. We talked about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. We never taught the reason why we all became teachers, obviously to inspire and motivate younger kids uh, and, and pupils and to um, make a difference. And what we're ultimately trying to do, we're trying to create um, uh, an environment or a culture where people suppress self-interest. So if, if people are motivated, as you can see in the graph, about themselves, their own personal glory, then you get effort, but you only get it intermittently. Um, by tapping into a deeper sense of motivation, the people who cared about you, so you might be working for your parents or for your wife or for your girlfriend or, or, or for your, your husband or your kids or whatever it is, um, um, you get that sacrifice and you get that commitment. Ultimately, the strongest of teams have that sense of band of brothers. We're all in it together. Um, and, and the ultimate suppressor of self-interest would be to fight for your country um, and, and, and literally put your body on the line. The shirt is where the All Blacks are, so they would put the shirt above anything else, the All Black shirt, and, and what that culture means to them and the legacy they want to leave as a group. Um, and ultimately, what we're trying to do is find an environment or create an environment where people put self-interest to one side. Um, and if you can do that as a leader, then you will, you will generate um, a great culture. And the final point is to understand how you're going to build your team. Um, and this is, there's lots of different models for doing this. This is just the order of events that I would, I would go um, uh, in terms of building a long-term high-performing team. And it doesn't matter whether it would be a rugby team, um, a, a business team, um, or a team in a different sport. Um, I would look at it in the same way and make sure each of the fundamentals of this leadership pyramid I want to show you are in place. So the bottom line, you get the culture right and, and you spend your time prioritising that in the first, however long it takes, 6, 12 months, 2 years, however long. Then we talk about the identity. So the identity of the team um, that you're working for uh, and talking about what you stand for. Um, for example, the team I'm coaching at the moment in Leinster, um, they have a very strong identity in the community. A lot of the players are from Dublin. Uh, a lot of the players are Irish, virtually all are Irish. So they have a very, very strong team identity and as a consequence, it makes them a very tight group of players. Um, and I constantly try and reinforce the importance of representing not just Dublin, but also Leinster. That high purpose of what we're trying to achieve, clearly in a rugby sense, we're trying to win the next trophy, um, the, the Pro 12 or the European Cup. But also, we want to build a team that um, leaves a legacy. And also, that means that you can um, look back on your time and feel you've added, added value and you've passed it on to the new generation of Leinster players in a better place. Um, it could be a higher purpose to, com to connect with the community or to become a respected team worldwide or whatever it is, but it's important to have that higher purpose that sits above um, the, uh, the short and medium term goals of winning trophies or, or getting the 
the figures to hit the top line by by the end of the year. Once you get that, then you get behaviors and standards from the people that you're leading, and as a consequence, then you can really drive high performance because the people on the ground take ownership of the of the, um, of the plan, uh, and it feels like it's their team, and it's not just you driving as a leader from the top. Ultimately, what you want is player-led leadership. So an environment where the players in a rugby sense or a football sense or a sporting sense are leading the team and driving the cultures and the values and the behaviours is the same as your employees or the people that you're leading are leading your organisation. And I don't think you can skip a step, to be honest. I think that's the, uh, um, that's the bottom line and, and that's the way I would, I would look to go about building it. So I hope there's a bit for you to reflect on there. Um, uh, I wanted to give you that foundation to start with and then ultimately the next modules will hopefully um, really uh, engage you and make you think uh, and there's opportunities to write questions down at the end and I'll collate them and we'll build the webinars and, and future learning and future presentations on the back of that. Okay, good luck, enjoy it.